Welcome to the Sessor Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of our day. My name is Daniel Yang, the director of the Church Multiplication Institute, and today we're talking with Benjamin Watson. Benjamin's a former NFL tight end, a college football studio analyst with the SCC Network, VP of Strategic Relations with the Human Coalition, and along with his wife, Kirsten, Benjamin's the founder of the Watson 7 Foundation, a nonprofit focused on strengthening families. He's the author of several books, including his latest, The New Fight for Life, Roe, Race, and Pro-Life Commitment to Justice. But before we talk to Benjamin, we want to remind you that if you're enjoying our interviews, please leave us a review, especially if you're a Spotify listener, that'll help increase our listenership on that platform. Now let's go to Ed Stetzer, Editor-in-Chief of Outreach Magazine and the Dean of the Talbot School of Theology. Well, it's so great to have Benjamin Watson here in a conversation with us today. And I, I told I told him beforehand that I'm the worst sports ball knowledge person ever, but I did Google and Google is our friend and I got to learn some about his journey and, and I want you to share a little bit about it. We're going to talk a lot about issues of uh, pro-life and, and for pastors and church leaders, how and why they would want to speak up on these issues. But I think in part your, your own journey is going to be a key part of what we what we talk about today. Again, the, the, the book, by the way, is The New uh, Fight for Life, Race, uh, we're going to be Roe Race and a Pro-Life Commitment to Justice as well. So tell us a little bit about your journey, uh, maybe how you became a Christian, what prompted you to write this book. Just walk as you want to walk through the telling of your story. Hey, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, exciting to be with you, followed you from afar for, for a long time now. So it's always fun to to meet people, even if it's uh, just over a podcast. So, yeah. so thank you for having me. And hey, sports is just one part of, of life. And so no offense, not knowing about sports. Look, it's all good. It's all good. Um, <laughs> but it's, but I, what I hate is when like someone's a big deal in sports like you, and I, I don't know. No, I told I'm not. You, this is what I always are. say. I always, Listen, I, you got a whole, I read the whole thing. You're a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I always say, if I'm a big deal, then you wouldn't have to go go to Google. Well, so, that's, but, but that's fair. But you, before we came out, I told you my story about meeting Bart Starr, and I did. didn't know who he was, and everyone made fun of me forever. So, so yeah, that's that's yeah. a that's a that pretty is, big deal. That, that is a bad one. So, so no matter who it is, if you were Joe Namath, there's a name I know. I, I wouldn't. <laughs> I might know that, but you're amazing. So, but anyway, tell us more your story. Well, sports has always been a big part of my life. Um, my father played uh, college football at University of Maryland. That's where he met my mom. Uh, I, my earliest childhood memories um, were, you know, grabbing a football, playing football with him in the yard. Uh, he would do a lot of speaking for Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And so growing up, uh, our family vacations were getting in the car. I'm the oldest of six kids. We would all get in the car and go wherever daddy was going to speak. Uh, for the FCA camps for that week. Those are kind of our family vacation. So I always loved the game. we we'll go with my dad when he would do chapel services for high school, professional, college football teams. Um, and so he, my dad was my hero. And, and, and as I look back and think about specifically where my love for sports came from, it came from him, but also from a faith standpoint, um, he's the one who led me to the Lord. I remember being about six years old and um, my dad as I mentioned, you know, six foot two, 250 pounds, like he had big arms, you know, that, that type of guy. And he would wrestle with me sometimes as a kid, he would have this big teddy bear and actually it was my teddy bear. And he'd be like, Benjamin, you want to fight the teddy bear? I'm like, yeah, daddy, I want to fight the teddy bear. And so he'd get behind the bear and wrestle with me and he let me win sometimes, but sometimes he, he proved a point, I guess, to try to toughen me up, I guess. But I remember one night I lost to the teddy bear and the story goes that I was in my bed saying, daddy, daddy, you bring that bear back out here. I'm not going to bed till I beat the teddy bear. So he brings the bear back out, lets me win. And that night, for whatever reason, he asked me if I knew what was going to happen to me when I died, even at six years old. And, you know, I was always very inquisitive about those sorts of things. And he shared with me a very familiar verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish from everlasting life. And right there, around six years old is when I passed from death into life. Um, and that's when the spirit called me. And so I got saved at a pretty young age. Um, but I thank God so much for my upbringing. I thank him for my, for my parents. Um, didn't agree with them all the time. My dad's a pastor. I know you talk to a lot of pastors on this podcast. And so I didn't agree with the rules all the time growing up. But as I look back and, and now being a parent um, of seven kids, my wife and I, and having played in the NFL for 16 years, we've moved all around the country doing that sort of thing. But I look back and I'm very thankful and grateful um, that God chose to place me in that home. 
uh, because even now, uh, as I as we parent our kids, so many of those those life lessons and just being rooted in the Word of God is something that's so important to us as parents. Well, I, I have a uh, I guess a holy jealousy about me being raised in a Christian home and those stories just they're warm my heart and that's that's super encouraging. Okay, so so grow up there, come to faith in Christ, and then again eventually. Uh, end up playing pro ball for a long time. Uh, I mean, for yeah. compared to some. So tell me about that. Well, yeah, yeah, definitely a long time. I think I was just really stubborn. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that's what it was. But uh, I, I grew up in Norfolk, Virginia, and then we moved to a place called Rock Hill, South Carolina when I was in 10th grade. My father um, worked for a ministry that planted churches and we moved the family down there and I okay, did not back, back, back that bus up. You got to tell somebody where he planted churches. What organization he working with was plant churches. <laughs> it was called urban discovery ministries, urban discovery ministries out of Norfolk, Virginia. Love it. And, um, yeah. And so this was like 1996 when we moved. That, that was before to... church planning was cool. I mean, that's, that's amazing. Your dad was a church <laughs> oh, yeah. That is but, so cool. I mean, right. I mean, I mean, you know, it, it, growing up, um, we went to a bunch of different churches. My father been involved with ministry, like I said, for ever since I can remember. Um, and some churches we attended were, you know, have been established. But the, I remember being parts of, you know, home churches, churches meeting in apartments um, that would that, grow that is uh, so out cool. of that. And um, you, yeah, yeah, I mean, as a kid, it's cool. But at the same time, you're like. I want all the bells and whistles from the bigger yeah. church. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, the, you know the big youth group. You know the big band. I mean, it's a different vibe in the new church. It's, it's that. different, but but it is very rewarding. So we moved to South Carolina. I didn't want to go. Didn't know where Rock Hill, South Carolina was on a map. Um, but football-wise, it turned out being great for me in high school. One of those small towns where everybody shows up for, for the games. And from there, I went to Duke University first, played there for one year, and then transferred to the University of Georgia, where I finished up. Uh, played there three years, graduated from there, met my wife there in FCA, and uh, and then it was drafted to the Patriots in 2004. Okay, now the Patriots would be the New England Patriots is what my recollection yep. would be. Okay, yep. and so then you've got this this career that goes from 2004, 2019. Is that, is that, is that about the right time? Yep. 15 yep. years, which is a very long time in sports ball to play. Yep. Uh, very long I, time. My, my last game, my last game was January of 2020. And I was, um, I was, I was 39. I just turned 39 years old in December. I turned 40 later that year in December. Wow. So I was one of the old guys. Basically, I was in the corner of the locker room, and the guys were like, "I used to play with you on Madden back in the day. Like, why? <laughs> why are you still playing?" <laughs> It is. It's a little intimidating, though, to to think about the longevity of that and 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 kind of the journey that that would ultimately be. Okay, so then you you retire from sports. It always seems strange to retire at a young age, but you know, there's a certain you can't play sports ball forever. Um, but then then you end up getting involved. I mean, you're you know you've written more than one book, but you're getting involved in Christian ministry. You're having some of these constant conversations and more, and you get you kind of navigate to. Uh, the pro-life cause. And and it, I think it's worth, and there's a couple of things I should mention under our skin, getting real about race. You write, write about this. Uh, then you're engaged in other things as well, uh, the New Dad's Playbook. But then the most recent book, the one that's really just out now, is uh, it's out in summer of 23, The New Fight for Life, Row, Race, and a Pro-Life Commitment to Justice. So what what kind of drew you to a cause I share with you? Why, 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 why did it become important to you? That's that's the million dollar question. I did not set out one day to say I want to be involved with this or I want to write a book about, you know, abortion and and life and race and all those sorts of things and kind of the connecting points between them. Um, I, I'll say this, as I mentioned before, I'm the father of seven. Um, my wife and I have seven ages, 14 down to four. We have identical twin boys that are four. We caught ourselves at number five going for an even number six and God gave us identical twins. Come on. <laughs> so so we're at, we're at perfect number seven. We're at the number of completion. But I remember when we had our first child, um, she's 14 years old now, and we got one of those 3D, 4D ultrasounds. And my, when we were leaving, my wife said, you know what, one day I'd love to be able to provide this service for other women um, and men who don't know about it or maybe don't have access to it. And so several years later, we partnered with a couple organizations and we started placing um, some ultrasound units in places where we live. So I played for the New Orleans Saints. We did one in New Orleans. We did one in Baltimore when I played for the Ravens. 
Um, you know, we've done some in our hometown and even where we live now in Georgia. And so that was kind of, it's kind of been one of our things. And it seemed to be when you're in the NFL and you engage in purchasing ultrasounds uh, as your philanthropic efforts, then it kind of gets a little bit of notice. Um, so I can't even claim that it was me. It was my wife and I, it was, it was really her desire in the beginning. And then we kind of did it together. But I will say that even growing up, this issue was um, one of many that my parents talked about. Um, but we didn't really talk about it in, in the pro-life vernacular. It, it was more life begins at conception. Um, people are made in the image of God, all those sorts of things that we talk about as believers. But it was very normal for us to to see the the preborn child as having inherent dignity and and value. And so standing for the child, standing for mom, um, speaking about those things kind of came um, second nature to me. And also because I kind of always looked at things as as this, as, as a justice issue. And even in the book, when I say a pro-life commitment to justice, to me, when I look at scripture and I look at God's heart for justice in, in so many different books of the Bible, when he talks about it, the justice is about protecting those who deserve protection. It's about punishing those who deserve punishment. Uh, it's about correcting where injustice has happened. And when I think about the preborn child, um, I think about someone who is defenseless. When I think about uh, mothers and fathers and, and communities and, and whatever the issues are, I, I think how can we as believers um, bring God's heart to justice in, in a sense of protection and, and, and holistic flourishing to people? And so even in the NFL, um, you know, a lot of times people ask, well, in the NFL, was it hard to talk about these sorts of things? And, you know, this 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 isn't easy. Um, this is a very political issue. Uh, it is an emotional issue. Uh, it can get you thrown in one corner or another corner. People lose friends, family members on their stance on either side of this issue. Um, but I will say that in the NFL, what I loved about it was the fact that you had a group of guys from from different backgrounds, um, even different faith traditions. Uh, but there was a certain respect we have for each other because we did life together. We sweat together, all those sorts of things. We didn't know everything about each other. I'm not saying it was utopia. But what I am saying is that I could have a heated discussion with someone over this issue or we could disagree and we could still function together on the same team. But also, I also found that as I spoke about this issue specifically, there were several people, coaches included, who would come up to me and say, man, I, I appreciate what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so that was always, always encouraging to me. And the Lord has, has opened a lot of doors just to be able to continue to speak on this. You never know what issues you will be able to be a champion for and for what season that will be. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, that's what we're walking in. Well, and it's interesting because you have you mentioned race, and that certainly becomes part of the conversation. Your Facebook post that went so viral after Ferguson verdict was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people discussing and walking through some of those issues you've written on the issue before, as well. And you tie these things in and around justice, justice issues, which I, I, I share that. I, I think, I think it's it's stunning to me that sometimes when I see the communities caring about justice and the unborn are left off that list, and sometimes people caring about the unborn. And maybe even seeing as justice, but issues of, of race or or marginalization or, or whatever else it may be are not on that list. I think we have to have a more broad. I, I don't use the term uh, pro life for everything. I think I think that's a that's a mistake right now because I think I think right now people are saying, well, I'm pro life because I'm I'm pro refugee. Well, I'm pro refugee because I'm whole life. But I think yeah, the unborn. It's kind of like saying you know all lives matter. The un the unborn right now need our specific attention. Um, yeah. Because a hundred years from now, we're going to look back, I believe, at this time with horror at how we treated the the unborn. So, mm -hmm. but but again, you you have kind of brought together race, row. I mean, it's even in the subtitle. Talk to us about how race fits into that. Well, as I began to, um, I, I did a documentary a while ago about this this issue um, called "Divided Hearts of America," and I and I issued and I interviewed uh, people in in faith, people in academia, people. Um, who were survivors of abortion, people on the left and the right, pro-choice, pro-life, just wanted to bring some empathy to the conversation um, and kind of see where America stood. But even in doing some research, I, I, I couldn't get away from this one statistic that kept popping up over and over and over again, and not only doing the, doc, doing the documentary, but just in pro-life conversations about abortion in general. 
Um, and the statistic goes something like this. Uh, black women are three to four times more likely to have abortions than their white peers. And uh, black Americans are more prone to have abortions disproportionately than any other ethnic group. And so, first of all, I wanted to say, is that really true? Um, and then second of all, um, if it is true, why is that happening? And, and all of the research that I did, um, the thing about abortion reporting, every state doesn't have to report. And so the statistics that we have on, on abortion are, are not complete, and they also lag a couple of years. But pretty much every single metric that we look at points to the fact that Black women and men are aborting at a higher rate than any other ethnic group. And so I thought to myself, okay, that's one thing to, to say the statistic. It's one thing to use that as a talking point. It's another thing to take the next step and say, why is this happening? Okay. Um, at, at Human Coalition, where I, I, I work, um, we're a pro-life organization, pro-life pro-woman organization. We use a lot of tech in advertising. But there's a stat that we found with abortion-determined women. It's that 76% of abortion-determined women would prefer their parent if their circumstances were different. Wow. 76% would prefer to parent if their circumstances were different. And we ask them about the circumstances. Number one, it's relationship with the dad, with the father. Um, but it's also things like um, reliable employment. It's, it's reliable housing. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's living in a food desert. It's health care. It's all these sorts of things that women will say are barriers or reasons why they're considering abortion. And when I pick that stat up and I lay it on top of the lived experience of Black Americans in this country, all those metrics are way up. Mm -hmm. From, from a disparity in wages um, to incarceration to poverty, um, all these things are way up. And so when I talk about race and justice in the pro-life conversation or in the, the anti-abortion conversation, it's like, if these are all the issues, how do we as pro-lifers, number one, how do we talk about it? And how do we address those things? Because as you mentioned before, a lot of times uh, the, the pro-life conversation is confined to the pre-born child and it should be. The pre-born child needs our protection. The laws are very important. I will never say that they aren't. Right. But when I'm looking at the experience of the mom and I'm looking at the experience of the dad, and specifically when it comes to black folks in this country, those two to me are tied together. And they can't be, be be stripped apart if we're going to have a holistic and honest conversation about abortion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's important. I think too, you both when you have conversations about race, and we're primarily talking about about abortion, but it, it would be worth people just reading. You know, they can Google your comments. You've you've spoken up on many times in many different ways, um, and 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 you also you often tie these together in the issue or in around the Imago Day that that you know the, this this matters across the board. It it matters that we see people as worthy of dignity and respect made in the image of God and more. Um, but part of the part of the challenges is that not everybody puts those together and in, in a lot of space um, in, in this, you know, white evangelical space, let's call it that in white evangelical space, uh, overwhelmingly pro-life, but maybe not as engaged in some other issues um, as well. And then you might find, um, you know, maybe people, people of color, maybe tr historic African-American churches might not be as involved, might be involved on issues of societal concern and more. Uh, and of course, there are, I, I was talking to John Jenkins, uh, who's pastor at uh, First Baptist Glen Arden. He's the, yeah. on the, uh, you know, you, you know him personally, but he's, um, he did a sermon on, on, uh, on a pro-life sermon. He's, he's pro-life. Uh, but he kind of prefaced it at the beginning, you know, some of you going to be unhappy with me and et cetera, et cetera. And I thought to myself, I don't know that that would be a conversation that I would have to say in a predominantly Anglo church as well. So what is what is some of the distinction? Help us, let me ask rather than observe, what are some yeah. of the distinctions here across racial boundaries? Well, a lot of it boils down to, to the politics of it. Okay. And what I try to do, especially in the book, is I even preface in the book, say, look, there are gonna be some policy suggestions. We need to consider um, education, healthcare for people, all those sorts of things that immediately when we say those, it's either red or blue. Right. And we need to think about them um, a la carte as how would it help or benefit life. And so when you look at um, the black community largely votes Democrat, sure. uh, the Democratic platform is is pro-choice. It is not pro-life. Um, yeah, I mean, some, in the point some, now some, some, like, say, some, some would say it's pro-abortion. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, and and so th that's what their political platform is. When you look and at aggressively, it, so aggressively, aggr so. Exactly. Not, not, aggr not where it was a decade ago with 100%. safe, legal, and rare. It's aggressive now. Yeah. Hundred percent. It, it it is it is um, you know advocated for. It is pushed. There's a lot of funding in it. If yeah. you're a Democrat running for office and and you say I'm I'm kind of moderate on that, you probably won't win because that's where the party platform has gone. Yeah. Now now black Christians largely according to 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 research um aren't as far to the left on abortion as the the platform is right, for it's, sure. it hasn't been until recently in this new generation where you've seen a lot of the views of the of younger black americans period but black christians kind of sway a little bit but traditionally the black community has been very conservative on on these types of social issues but the civil rights part of it is why many vote for for Democrats. Then on the other side, you've got, you know, as you mentioned, the white evangelicals, and it's is hard Republican, um, pro-life. And and as you know, that term only really came about in the 80s or so. Um, the actual term pro-life, as far as the political um stance goes. And so you have this divide, but within that, and on both sides, you have people who have a pro-life ethic. Yeah. And so I think that the 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 schism why it's hard sometimes to reconcile when I talk to um, white believers and they say, why do black Christians vote for Democrats? <laughs> and then to talk to black Christians and be like, I can't believe these white people vote for these, these racist Republicans. You, There's been such politicalization of issues that as believers should not be politicized. Mm -hmm. Now, the challenge is we, we live in a, a politic. We live in a constitutional republic. And so this is what it is. But as believers, uh, it's how we speak about it. It's how we speak about all those issues to and how we encourage our congregations, if we're church leaders or youth group leaders, to think about things outside of the political constraints that have been levied upon us because we live in the United States of America. I mean, I, I just don't think that for a lot of people, they realize, um, you know, just how extreme Roe was and, you know, and, 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 and really laws have become more extreme since then. But Roe was, was, I mean, the abortion laws in the United States, the USA Today did a fact check because uh, people would say that, you know, they kind of lined up with seven other nations in the world listing, you know, yeah. China and North Korea. And the USA Today fact check, we'll put it in the show notes, actually said, yes, that's the case. So people don't really realize that as well. And there's need for that changing, but more training as well, too. And you got, tell us a little bit about this uh, curriculum resource that you have as well. Yeah, one thing I, I would mention also to, to church leaders and pastors, an um, organization called Stand for Life. Um, it's basically an alliance of several different pro-life organizations. But I recorded a six-part uh, series for church leaders, for pastors, 20-minute um, videos, but it's also a booklet. But it talks about the image of God in the preborn child, the image of God in children in general, the image of God in, in men and women, and, and kind of just, just creates a, a curriculum for any pastor um, if they didn't have one or they didn't have a sermon to speak, you know, to preach on their own, just to kind of start conversation in churches, but also give tools to church leaders so that we can start talking about this from a um, a place of power and conviction um, and, and biblical authority. Again, the title of the book is The New Fight for Life, Roe, Race, and a Pro-Life Commitment to Justice. I think your book is the first Christian book that I read that was out since the overturn of Roe v. Wade. Uh, so, I mean, I'm impressed that pretty quick. Um, so, so I rejoiced on that day. Uh, I know you made public comments as well, rejoicing on that day. Why, why do you think the overturn of Roe v. Wade really matters so much? Well, I think from a, uh, constitutional perspective, it was, uh, egregiously decided in the first place mm -hmm. to, to, to find the, the right to an abortion in the 14th amendment, which was a reconstruction amendment, um, took a lot of finagling. And so just from that standpoint, I don't think it was right in the first place. But then secondly, as a as a believer, someone who is is, is pro-life, someone who is is, is pro-child and pro-woman, um, I believe anytime we can protect life, it's important. And we should do so. And so I, I rejoice for for a couple of reasons. I, and I, one, one of them I think has been manifest because in the last year, um, many thousands of lives have been saved. I saw one stat where, of course, in some states, abortions have gone up, but it's been, the, the overall net is that there's been thousands of lives saved. And when we when we think about lives, we think about image bearers. 
We think about people who have, who have value and they've been saved. And not only them, it's going to be their progeny that comes from them. And so anytime life is preserved is something to rejoice about. Um, but also, I, I think that it was confirmation for a lot of people who have worked really, really, really hard. Um, we've been involved, like I said, over the last, I would say the last five, six years, pretty heavily in attending events, speaking at events, writing, um, working with pro-life organizations, supporting pregnancy resource centers. There's 2,700 of them in the United States. And there are some people in all walks of life who have worked incredibly hard. They've prayed incredibly hard. They've, they've donated their own funds. They've stood in front of, of uh, abortion clinics. They have prayed with people. They, they, they fought on different levels. And that was a moment of celebration because of everything that they have been pointing towards now. And the reason why I say the new fight for life is that it's going to look a little, little bit different now. And it has looked different. Obviously on the state level, it's a, it's a daily battle when it comes to legislation and there's a patchwork of legislation around the country. But also I think that for the pro-life movement, now is a time to not only be refocused and re-energized, but kind of re-understand where our goal is. And our goal is not just Roe. Ultimately, the goal is to make abortion unthinkable because we live in a culture that thinks that, mm, that that's just not positive for us, but also to make it unnecessary, which is a kind of a, a dicey word to use, but unnecessary meaning all those issues that I mentioned before, right? Um, the 76 percent, that those aren't reasons that women and men use anymore to have abortions. Will we eradicate abortion ever? Not this side of heaven. But it's time for us to reimagine what it's going to take to make it unthinkable and necessary, because as great as laws are, um, th they aren't going to change um, people seeking abortions. Yeah. But if you can get to the faucet and turn off the faucet and pull people out of the stream by maybe doing some things that might be outside of your political party, outside of your political bent, that's how we really get to the root of the issue. Yeah, and I, I think I think I, I've I've written I'm on public record that laws need to change. Roe was just a, a, we like said poorly cited, but also I mean I don't think people realize just how extreme Roe was uh, with its full interpretation, basically that you know no restrictions, you know up till birth and more, and you know people people can deny and push back on that, but at the end of the day, that's how and now it's that's actually the law now in California, in Illinois, places where I where yeah. I live as well. Um, so so changing laws I think matters. But in Illinois and California, at least places I'm in, uh, you, right now we got to change hearts and we got to change people's minds. Make you make make it unthinkable and 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 more. So so the question I guess is how to do that because right now there's some debate in the pro life movement about yeah. um, do we continue to work incrementally? Is incrementalism the path, or is there something more we should do? I want to talk broadly, and then I want you to talk to my audience of pastors and church leaders and say what you think they can do. So, but let's start broadly. So what, how do we take, and this is a big part of the book as well. Yeah. So, so again, just to remind everybody, cause I, I want, I want them to pick up the book. I think it's, it's helpful and, and, and you'd want to pick it up. It's the new fight for life, row race and a pro-life commitment to justice. So big picture, incremental steps. Where do we go from here? Yeah. Big picture. You know, there's kind of two, two ways it seems that like people approach it. And and there's kind of a schism, I think, in the pro-life movement when it comes to those who want everything banned and they will stop at nothing less and they don't see incrementalism as a yeah. win. And they, and they, they sometimes call themselves abortion abolitionists, abolitionists which kind yeah. of points back to the the idea of, of slavery as well. So exactly. so, so keep coming back. Exactly. Um, for me, and I, personally, I, I live in the spirit of abolitionism. Um, that that I, I I want abortion completely banned. I I want an end to abortion. I don't see it as a, as a as a good. Um, I don't see it as a as a positive thing. But I also understand how things work in this country, and and there is there are small wins that we can have. What we have to as a movement continue to stay encouraged, but continue to stay hungry. If I can go back to my to my football days, um, we would have wins. In, the, in New England and other places where I played throughout the season, but we still stayed hungry for more. We win a Super Bowl, but still be hungry the next year because there was always more to be had. And I think we have to have that. I think what's happened after Roe was overturned is a little bit of apathy set in. Yeah. And many people felt like, well, that's it. It's over. 
And even if your state has a 50, let's say a 15 week ban, 91% of abortions occur between the first 13 weeks. And so even if your state has a ban, that's a good thing. That's a great thing. 15 weeks. That's a great thing. There are lives that are going to be saved. But the truth of the matter is 90 something percent happened before that anyway. We have to continue to fight for, for those children's lives and realize that they are still hanging hanging in the balance. And so, but broad picture, uh, a couple of things. Number one, it, it is on the state level. It's um, supporting life-affirming legislation. It's also about considering things like, like healthcare access. How do we increase those things? It's also things like um, education. And when I say education, what I mean is specifically even when it comes to a, a racial um, breakdown that districts of predominantly white, whether they are richer or poor, receive more funding than districts that are predominantly non-white, and specifically black black Americans. And so, realizing that and reading about it, don't take my word for it. Do some research, read about it. How is that a life issue? I had a conversation with that about that with someone, and I'm like, well, that's kind of a policy thing. That's not that's not really about pro life. I said, really. Let me let me ask you this. The average woman who has an abortion, according to both pro-life and the New York Times. So two different types of groups. Those are different sources. <laughs> exactly. She's usually in her late 20s. Yeah. She usually has a child already. She usually has employment, but is either partially or underemployed. And she usually has at least a high school education, maybe some college, but that's about it. Now, we know people with doctorate degrees have abortions. People with no education all have abortions. I'm just saying that, that the average. And so when I think about her education, how can we not draw a link between increasing the quality of education for all young people in this country and not see how that ties to their probability of having an abortion? That's just, that, that's just one example of how I think the pro-life movement, we have to open our eyes to a few things. And, and and that's when we talk about, you know, the black church and and you know voting, a lot of people voting Democrat and like, oh, how do you reconcile that? One thing I can say, and I talk about this in the book about the black church, um, is that they're really, really aware of these systemic ongoing um injustices that have been compounded and and the result of them. Hmm. And and we have had to have in the black community a very, very broad um, view on the many different issues and, and, and sections of American life that have been great for us and things that have not been so good for us. And how do we challenge those while still doing it in a way and for a reason that is rooted in the word of God? Um, I, I look at uh, my good friend in Chicago, Dr. Charlie Dates, and he's at two big black churches in Chicago, um, but has has talked about the issue of abortion, but has also realized, hey, I got I to gotta teach these black kids how to read because literacy will help them have a future where perhaps abortion might not be an issue. I think about the Church of God in Christ, who, which is the largest black denomination in America. They've come out with a, a pro-life anti-abortion platform saying this is what we believe. And so there are plenty of examples, but but I think that the you know yes the broad and and then the more narrow uh, I, I think is identifying those churches and leaders that are doing it, those organizations that are doing it, but also personally we have to try as much as we can to to dig into some spaces that might be uncomfortable and be willing to maybe champion some issues that we may not have had before. Yeah, I think it's interesting because I think in a sense what's happened is we've sort of issues now correlate with one another. So if you're pro-life, you're probably also uh, pro-lower taxes, pro-higher defense spending. You know, they they they, they correlate yeah. together. They, and then yeah. if you're it's you know, like you got pro, this package, you got that yeah. package or that package. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I and I think when it comes to some of these issues that 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 part of the challenge is, is we gotta break some of those correlations because yeah. the reality is and you're and you're you're doing that. You're helping to frame those conversations differently. And and that's going to make some people frustrated, uh, but it makes me encouraged that, and you mentioned Charlie Dates, who's a dear friend. I just preached for him earlier this summer. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah. And I will tell you, I, I recently, you know, my sports ballness is terrible. 
So when I was, I threw out the first pitch for the White Sox and, and, oh, wow. uh, and it, it wasn't terrible, but it was, you know, it was okay. So someone asked me if I was nervous and if you've been to Charlie's church, you know, that it's adjacent, it shares a property line with the White yep. Sox stadium. And oh. I said to them, I was far more nervous preaching at that church right there <laughs> after the Charlie dates. Day. Cause can you imagine preaching after Charlie? Anyway, another story for hey. another day. Um, yeah. Yeah. We got to have a whole podcast on, on, on him. <laughs> oh my gosh. He's a remarkable, I did. I had him in my leading community. He's one of the leading communicators in, in the country, perhaps the world. But anyway, um, so we got, we're, we're running out of time, but I want you to talk to pastors and church leaders. They're, they're our audience and they're, they're sometimes unsure. They, they, they're probably overwhelmingly pro-life, but they don't want to be political. Uh, however people phrase that though. I don't know there's any, I mean, we didn't politicize these issues. These are life issues, yeah. but, but, but they're afraid of being political. They're afraid of saying the wrong thing. Maybe they don't want to get caught up in the incrementalist or the abortion abolitionist sort of approach. Um, and, 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 but so, so what would you encourage them? How would you encourage them to speak up, stand out on what I think is one of the most important issues one of the defining issues of our day? What, what would you say? Yeah. Well, the first thing I would say to pastors is, is, is to speak. Yeah. And I don't think we can take that for granted because uh, recent research implies that many pastors are not speaking about this issue, at least not from the pulpit. And and I'm I'm not saying you have to give a whole sermon on, on abortion in Roe, but even incorporate it into sermons, this idea of, of addressing this issue that is glaring in the culture right now and has been. I saw a, a stat that says something like less than 10% in evangelical churches of churchgoers have heard a message on abortion. And so if that's true, if it's around 10, 15%, I mean, how are we leading from in front about this really, really important issue? Secondly, four in 10 women who have had abortions, and I like to say four in 10 men, if it's four in 10 women, um, are in the church. And so if they're in our pews, if they are um, sitting next to us, if they're doing small group with us in Bible studies, but they are feeling the compound weight and the and the guilt and the uselessness and the all those sorts of things that Satan will heap on them. But then from leadership, they're not hearing that there is forgiveness, there is restoration, there is purpose in the pain that you're dealing with. We will come around you. You still have value. Um, where are they going to get it from? And so it, my encouragement is not, you know, is, is that there are plenty who are doing this from the pulpit. I know several. But if you're not and you're scared to do it, I understand that because some of the people in your church might get up and go. <laughs> they might be like, you know, I don't, I didn't come for this. I don't want to hear this. Um but I believe that in this time that the, the church has to have a strong voice that is both loving and just, that is both about, um, you know, truth, but also about forgiveness uh, that, that is, that is rooted in, in, in the Imago Dei and how we view people, because then we set the foundation for so many other issues. It, it allows you to speak about issues of race um, that can be just as contentious and political but when you're rooted in that, you know, value of human life, you can branch off into the other things because you're coming back to the source. You're coming back to truth. So number one is to talk is to talk about. It. Then number two, um, you know, I say talking about sex too. <laughs> and you know, I, I laugh because it's one of those things that a lot of folks don't talk about in church. Yeah. And you know, speaking about a, a biblical sexual ethic um, to our youth. Um, to our adults. Um, it's amazing the things that we frown upon um, in churches when it comes to different sin, but sexual sin, sometimes we don't have the same, we don't turn our nose up the same way where, where, the, where scripture is really clear. And so these are things that have to be talked about because our children, our young people, um, our married couples, uh, our grandparents, well, we all need to hear those sorts of things from the pulpit. And so th there are a number of, a number of things I think that pastors should do, but that's, that's the, that's the encouragement that I will have for them. I, I would have, I would have one more thing. And this Please. is more, this is more practical. I mentioned before the 2,700 or so pregnancy resource centers that are around the country. These, these organizations are many times the front lines um, receiving some women that are determined to abort, but others that simply need a word of encouragement. They need some material assistance there's a there's a dad that needs another man to tell him that he can do it um whatever it may be 
find some of those places in your local community if there is one and and see how you can see how you can engage benjamin watson um fascinating learning about you and now learning from you thanks for taking the time to be in the stetzer church leaders podcast thanks so much man it was an honor We've been talking to Benjamin Watson. Be sure to check out his book, The New Fight for Life, Row, Race, and the Pro-Life Commitment to Justice. You can learn more about Benjamin at thewatson7.com. Thanks again for listening to the Sets of Church Leaders podcast. You can find more interviews as well as other great content for ministry leaders at churchleaders.com slash podcast. And again, if you found our conversation today helpful, we'd love for you to take a few moments to leave us a review that'll help other ministry leaders find us and benefit from our content. Thanks for listening. We'll see you in the next episode.